The other point to raise maybe is if you look at the global panorama today of armed conflict, although it doesn't seem this way, given the horrific atrocities that are taking place in Syria, given the great uncertainty in Crimea and, and, the, and the Ukraine, given the extraordinary challenges that we face in Central African Republic and Sudan, it may seem like the number of conflicts are in fact going up, but actually the long-term trends suggest that the number and intensity of conflicts is going down. We have fewer cross-border conflicts between states than at any other time in the last 50 years. The number of internal conflicts is also go down, going down. Today we have something in the order of 32, 33 ongoing civil conflicts. That's the lowest rate we've had in 15 years, and it's, we think that by 2050 we're going to be going down to about 14. So the, the long-term secular trends are down. Now, of course, climate change, terrorist attacks, political uncertainty, financial crisis, these kinds of factors could come and generate new forms of, 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 of challenges and could lead to a spike in conflict. But the overall aggregate trends are going down. So for the aid community, I think that's good news. I think no one can dispute. But at the same time, although we're seeing an overall decline in the intensity and frequency of armed conflicts, we're also seeing a gradual increase in the rate and severity of certain forms of homicidal violence outside of war zones. To put this in perspective, there's something in the order of 55 to 60,000 people dying every year in war zones around the world. 55 to 60,000 people dying violently in war zones. A number of more people, 100,000 to 300,000 more people die as a result of indirect costs of violence from sickness and illness, and malaria. But about 55 to 60,000 people dying violently, which is a horrible number of people. But if you compare that to the people dying violently outside of war zones, you have to rethink the picture. There are at least 500,000 people dying outside of war zones violently every year. So in other words, 10 times more people are dying outside of war zones than inside war zones. So that's not to suggest for a minute that we should not be focusing on alleviating suffering and, and promoting humanitarian assistance and expanding resilience of communities inside war zones. But it does raise some fundamental questions about what we as an aid community, we as humanitarians, we as uh, development actors, what we ought to be doing in those zones outside of, of open pitched armed conflict. In a way, the countries of Central America and many of the countries in the Andean region, and, and certainly Brazil, uh, they're very much ground zero. They're the front line of this unconventional, non-official conflict. They're the countries that are experiencing the greatest burden of, of intentional violence outside of war zones. I think they constitute something in the order of 18 to 20 percent of the population, but 40 percent of the overall aggregate number of homicides in the world. So the only two parts of the world where we're seeing a, an increase, an escalation of this non-conflict homicidal violence is in Central America and South America and the Caribbean, together with Central Africa and Southern Africa. Virtually everywhere else in the world, be it in North America, Western Europe, Eastern Europe, the Caucasus, uh, Southeastern Europe, all the way to Asia, down to the Pacific, virtually everywhere else you're seeing a steadying out or a decline. So what we have are two parts of the world that I think are disproportionately affected by these new forms of unconventional violence. Uh, and I think for the first time, the aid world is starting to open its eyes to this. I think over the last number, couple of years, especially with the decline in, 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 in overall numbers and intensities of armed conflicts around the world, I think humanitarian actors, relief workers, researchers, academics, they're starting to pivot towards this region and recognizing this epidemic of violence that's unfolding this catastrophe of, of, of lost lives. And it's not just the lost lives. I mean, there are tens of thousands of people killed violently uh, across Latin America every year. 50,000 people die violently. In Brazil, it's the world leader of homicides globally every year. 38,000 of those people die from gunshot injuries. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. Because on top of that, there are four to five times more people who are injured, not lethally, but suffer non-lethal injuries from firearm injuries. Injuries to the skull, injuries to the arms, disabilities that leave lasting physical and psychological scars. And what happens when you're injured? Well, you can't go to work. You're taking unemployment insurance, if in fact insurance exists. Uh, you're not able to provide for family. Children can't go to public or private schools anymore. You're not able to buy school uniforms. Uh, 
you can't pay for the services. So suddenly you're in a situation where an injured individual, in a way, is a greater burden to the household than somebody who f tragically dies in the course of violence. And these impacts last not just years, they last generations. And it contributes, in a way, to cycles of impoverishment and inequality, which fuel and beget yet still more violence. So there's a need to interrupt this cycle. There's a need to address it. And there are a number of ways to do it. And I think the good news from Latin America, and again, the good news that can be, I think, picked up by, by others around the world, and the good news coming from Rio, is that there's extraordinary experimentation uh, and, uh, going on with violence prevention programs across the region. In fact, I think Latin America is really, really an innovator, one of the world leaders when it comes to thinking about new forms of violence prevention, using good data and diagnostics, using technology, thinking about dealing with structural root causes and risks, enhancing resilience and protective factors. I think we're seeing cities, we're seeing states, uh, in some cases we're seeing capitals and at the national level, and even regional institutions starting to support and expand efforts to try to prevent and reduce violence. And so there is, I think, some good news in spite of all of this misery around the violence. I think there are examples of really exciting programs in Cali, in Medellin, in Bogota, in Colombia since the late 1990s. Uh, of exploring programs to collect guns and turn them into art or looking at ways to reduce alcohol consumption at certain times of the day because uh, we all know that violence tends to concentrate after 9, 10 o'clock at night, usually near discos uh, and, and well into the early hours of the morning. So looking at concentrated programs to incre increase you know, uh, uh, limitations around uh, free access to alcohol. Um, rethinking the war on drugs, not necessarily going after uh, all mini traffickers, but really going after the organized crime dons. Uh, and maybe not putting young people who are first-time traffickers in jail, looking at alternative sentencing. Because we know that across Latin America, prisons are effectively universities for crime. And putting young first-time offenders into a prison is the best way to turn them into a future criminal, which is a, the worst possible investment from a public policy perspective. But other innovations are taking place, uh, changing the built environment of cities creating funiculas and ways of connecting poor areas to rich areas, I think are some of the greatest ways of promoting social organization and getting rid of social disorder, which tends to reproduce violence. Right here in Rio, we have one of the most, I think, extraordinary experiments underway with policing taking place, the so-called pacification program. The UPP, or the Pacification Police, was started in 2009, really is an experiment to break the military-first securitized approach to policing that had predominated in the past. And what it involves is the training, recruitment and training of 9,000 new police officers, most of them trained in human rights, uh, trained in community outreach, as opposed to only trained in military tactics. And it involves deploying police, sometimes for the first time inside slums and favelas and low-income communities, uh, and creating a permanent presence. So police aren't just coming in and out and shooting up the community, they're actually coming in to stay. In many cases, they're providing courses and schooling and teach, teaching capoeira or guitar lessons. So there's a, an attempt to try to, in a way, pacify the police as much as pacify areas that have previously been dominated by drug trafficking organizations. And what we've seen from this program over the last hmm, five, six years, it's quite extraordinary. We've seen a 65% drop in lethal violence in Rio de Janeiro. Rio, 10 years ago, was in the top five most violent cities of Brazil. Today, I think it's number 15 or 16. So it's, we've seen a dramatic improvement in, in Rio in terms of lethal violence reduction through the positioning in an intelligent way of pacification police. We've also seen a reduction in stray bullets. That was a huge fear in communities across Rio of, of having a bullet come through the window and taking out a child or, 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 or disrupting uh, the lives of people in all sorts of ways. And so we've seen a dramatic reduction in what they call bala perdidas, stray bullets. You've also seen uh, an improvement in, in confidence of communities that have been pacified, certainly amongst many of the households living within the community, but also just around the community, who themselves have said survey after survey demonstrating a confidence in this new program. Now, nothing's perfect. There are big challenges with the pacification program. You cannot create public safety and prevent violence through police alone. We know that from lessons of programs all around the world. So one of the great challenges of the pacification experience in Rio has been that they've been unable yet to accompany 
the proximity and community policing model with an effective social program that can also fill the development gaps. Programs that promote better services and hygiene and health and access to water and light. Programs that create safe spaces for young people to be able to play and enjoy recreation. Programs that seek to harness the ingenuity and creativity of people in these communities. Extraordinary levels of, uh, of inventiveness of, of these communities. Um, on the social side, we still haven't seen the kind of push that we've seen, for example, on the policing side. And so there are great concerns in Rio that unless you're able to invest on the developmental side of violence prevention and not just the policing side, that the program won't necessarily succeed in the long term. So these extraordinary reductions in, in lethal violence, uh, these improvements in, in, in popular perceptions of the police, uh, this growing confidence and sense of security, all of this is quite ephemeral if you're unable to support it with longer term development programs, such as those provided by uh, the World Vision, for example, and other agencies around the world. So Rio, in a way, it, it represents, I think, many of the challenges, but also many of the opportunities available to city officials, uh, to non-governmental organizations, to civil society groups. It shows that although you might face insurmountable, what seem to be insurmountable challenges, there are ultimately many ways to be able to overcome them. And I think these kinds of lessons could be extraordinarily useful for governments, especially local governments across Central America, especially those in the Golden Triangle, especially uh, our, our countries of El Salvador and Honduras and Guatemala, which in a way are top of the league in terms of violence. We know, I think, of the top 50 most dangerous cities, uh, routinely Latin American cities and in particular Central American cities come out often in the top 10, um, even in the top five. And I think there is, or there appears to be a growing recognition regionally, uh, but also nationally and definitely at the local and city level that we've got a problem in our big cities um, and that we can't just deal with them with repressive mano dura type approaches. We need to be thinking about violence prevention in the long term if we're going to have any dent uh, and, and improve people's well-being and safety. <laughs>